and it looks like this. Um, uh, this is actually from a group of seven to eight year olds that um, Heather Henderson, who was at that time a graduate student of mine, did just to see whether or not there were, one can uh, identify an ERN or error-related negativity in children. And she was able to. And what you can see here is that there's a greater negative amplitude to uh, the trial in which the subject made a mistake as opposed to the trial in which the subject was correct. That's the yellow versus the red is when they made an error. So our question is, well, we now know, we knew that the behaviorally inhibited subjects were slower on a trial after they made a mistake, but what did their ERP or their brains look like when they made a mistake? And so here's the amplitude of the ERN for our behaviorally inhibited uh, subjects and our non-behaviorally inhibited subjects, those are the yellow, uh, to correct and incorrect trials. So what you can see here, the important difference is on the right there. The yellow are the non-behaviorally inhibited subjects. So they're showing an ERN, because you would expect to find an ERN. But the behaviorally inhibited subjects are showing a significantly greater ERN compared to the non-behaviorally inhibited subjects. That is, their brains are telling them something about their response monitoring more so than a non-behaviorally uh, inhibited subject. However, the more interesting thing is if we divide up our behavioral, because remember this was done while they were adolescents, if we divide up our behaviorally inhibited subjects into those who had a diagnosis of social phobia and those who did not have a diagnosis of social phobia, we actually find significant interaction. And really the place to look is on the right hand side of the graph between the healthy behaviorally inhibited and the behaviorally inhibited subjects who had uh, a diagnosis of social phobia. And what you can see there is that if you were a behaviorally inhibited subject and had this diagnosis of social phobia, then the magnitude of your ERN was actually greater than it was if you were a behaviorally inhibited subject with no uh, diagnosis uh, of this anxiety disorder. So here we are, we think we are narrowing in on, um, sometimes it's called in psychiatric literature an endophenotype, but uh, I think that the a more important uh, way to describe it is an underlying attention mechanism that may differ differentiate those children who are temperamentally behaviorally inhibited from those children who are temperamentally behaviorally inhibited but who also have a disorder or uh, an anxiety disorder, much like the kind of question that Ron was raising uh, in his talk earlier. Um, I have one, uh, one more slide that I want to uh, show you, and that is some of the more recent work that we're uh, doing right now. I guess I'm doing okay for time because I haven't seen you uh, uh, flash the, the signs up there. Okay, so that gives me a, a chance to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now, um, given our interest in attention. Um, in our behaviorally inhibited children, and particularly behaviorally inhibited children uh, who have anxiety disorders. Um, again, going back to Colin McLeod, who is this uh, very clever um, cognitive uh, scientist from Australia, by the way, did I mention that? Um, um, who developed the dot probe task. So what McLeod, uh, as I mentioned in some of his earliest studies, he showed that anxious individuals showed this attention bias to threat. But what McLeod wanted to know is whether or not um, there was a causal link between this attention bias to threat and anxious behavior or or anxiety disorders, if you will. But let's just leave it at anxious behavior. So what he did is he recruited a group of uh, adults who 
um, and he screened them to make sure that they were not anxious, so they did not show elevated scores on measures of anxiety. And then, this is now, you have to follow this, uh, the bottom panel of this slide. And then he randomly assigned the, uh, these subjects to one of two conditions. Um, so now you have to go up to A, all right? Because here's a traditional dot probe, right? Uh, there's the Q, there's the angry face and the neutral face, there's the target that's right behind the angry, it's congruent with the angry face. So in the subjects who he, who he um, assigned to training, he showed them lots of trials of the dot probe, but 100% of the time, the target was congruent with the angry face. Okay? For the subjects who were randomized to just placebo, they got 50-50. Sometimes it was congruent, sometimes it was the, tar uh, the target was uh, congruent with the neutral face. Okay, everybody got that? What he did is he measured their attention bias before uh, they were randomly assigned to these two conditions, and then he measured their attention bias afterwards, and then he put them into a stress induction procedure, unsolvable anagram, and he measured their stress responses, and he also asked them, um, gave them questionnaires about their anxiety. What he found was that those subjects who were, well, two things that he found. First thing that he found is that he could train the bias. So those subjects who started out without a bias and who were randomized to the attention training procedure in which 100% of the time the target was congruent with the angry face, they developed an attention bias to threat. For those subjects who did not, they maintained no bias between pre and post. Okay? So the first thing he did is he showed I could train, that he could train the bias. The second thing he did is when he compared the level of stress that the subjects reported and that they showed in this unsolvable anagram procedure, and then later their self-reported anxiety, he found significant differences between his train, training group and his placebo group. So the training group reported more stress, they behaved in a more stressful way during the unsolvable anagram, and they self-reported more anxiety after the training compared to the placebo group. So McLeod's argument was, is that he established a causal link between developing this attention bias to threat and at least the vulnerability or the, uh, the exposure to the ability to be uh, stressed out and more anxious uh, in particular kinds of situations. Whoops, let me get rid of that. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, and I have uh, done the same attention training procedure with nine-year-old children. Um, we've taken those children, and that's in the upper uh, right-hand panel. That's Yair Bar Chaim, who's at Tel Aviv University. And you take, you take non-anxious children, and you randomly assign some to training so that they develop the bias, and some that are randomized to not, uh, to the 50-50 or to the placebo. And what you can see there in the, uh, and that's panel C, in the left-hand most graph, what you can see there is that in the train to neutral, there's no development of an attention bias, but in training to angry, what you get is an increase in these attention bias to threat in these nine-year-old children as a function of training. Then those kids were put into a stressful situation. It was a situation in which they had to solve a puzzle, and they were timed, and the experimenter was giving them a lot of aggravation and making them more and more stressed out, and in fact, what we found Found is that those children who had been trained to have this attention bias to threat, that they in fact 
uh, exhibited behaved, they showed more signs of anxiety and stress during that unsolvable puzzle compared to those kids who had uh, been trained, had been in the placebo training group.